In this video, I'm re-instrumenting demons on iOS to play custom sounds on the AirTag and also downgrade the firmware. The underlying technology for these hooks is Frida, which can instrument Objective-C runtime. For instrumenting Objective-C, only a few details have to be known. It's not required to understand most Objective-C features since existing code is modified. Instead, it's important to know where Objective-C is used and what the naming conventions are. For example, everything I'm instrumenting in the following is part of core location, core Bluetooth, and search party. Figuring out where an object is defined is sometimes a bit tricky since there are multiple places. For the first example, you don't even need to write code. After installing Frida on the jailbroken iPhone and your local machine, which can be macOS or Linux, you can run tools like Frida Trace. The parameter minus u means that you can run it on a remote USB device, minus minus decorate will add library names, and minus m allows tracing objective C function calls. Note that it is minus m and not minus i here, which accepts a different syntax. In this example, an SP beacon is created, which is short for search party beacon. These beacons are a wrapper around information sent in Bluetooth LE advertisements. Now let's take a look into this in practice. So here I'm tracing everything in the search party daemon that starts with SP, so all objects and their functions. This is quite a lot because there is a lot of search party stuff in the search party daemon. And you can already see each thread gets a different color and then all the calls within that thread are also named here. You can see stuff with advertisements going on, also with locations, etc. And this is the way how we can find out how some of the objects are being used. So we can just scroll through this, wait a bit, etc. and see what happens. Analyzing Objective-C code statically is a lot of work. Messages are sent to objects, but these objects are not always resolved. All that is left are function calls to Objective-C message sent. If objects are defined in a different binary, they cannot be resolved, and there are also various other issues that could lead to unresolved objects. This makes it very difficult to read the code, sometimes even if you have IDA. Instead, we can use Frida. All Objective-C object information is present during runtime of a process, so we can hook into a process and even use tab completion to get information. Before we can actually call functions on the SP beacon that we just created, we also have to allocate it. And now we can say various stuff like s dot and then, I don't know, set something. And there is a lot of things that we can call and probably never need. But uh, we can also set the name, model, and so on. There's also some stuff that I haven't reverse engineered yet. For example, there is some source property, whatever it does. Let's use this feature for a first demo. The SP beacon is used by various demons. So if we manage to overwrite information in there, it will be present in all other demons as well. By overwriting the SP beacon, we can also set a custom firmware version and serial number. What you can see here is a script that overrides the SP beacon with custom values. So I have global variables to define the version that I want and the serial that I want. And now if I look for the serial below here, these are my functions that I use to override. So there is the SP beacon set system version and the SP beacon set serial number function that I hook and override with my custom values. I can just load the script. So I just say load the script and no pause so that I can also do some modification in parallel. The first possibility to change the version is that I overwrite it in the script and save the script again. So for example, I can do this. And in a moment, this should also appear in here. It always takes a bit. Um, until it's updated. But the reason for this is that we need to wait until the next beacon is received. So this is not because reader is low, this is just a property of the script. 
And we don't even need to save the script again. If we define global variables, we can actually now have all the functions that I already defined run in background and set global variables. So I can just set whatever version string I want. And now, as I said, wait again for a moment until the next beacon is received. And here we go. We have the firmware version set to something other random. As a next step, let's send custom messages to an air tag. Usually one would have to do a lot of manual work for this. First of all, pair an air tag with an iPhone. Then a secret key is generated, which needs to be extracted in order to be able to connect another device to it than the iPhone. This is still not sufficient because this other device would need to know the message from it. We can try to figure out what this message from it is by sniffing communication and then playing a sound and matching this by hand. The Bluetooth daemon sends such commands to the Bluetooth chip. This interface can already be hooked to inject custom commands, assuming that we know the format. This already bypasses the first barrier of extracting a valid encryption key for Bluetooth communication with an AirTag. However, the Bluetooth daemon does not directly send such commands. Instead, the location daemon handles data sent to and received from the AirTag. All data is forwarded over XPC. The location daemon implements a Durian service for the AirTag. Durian is the AirTag codename. The service can execute tasks which then trigger commands which have an opcode and a payload. These tasks, commands and opcodes have names. Most of them already appear in the Frida trace. This helps a lot with protocol reverse engineering. When hooking into the location daemon, we can now list all opcodes. Note that there are two sets of opcodes, one for Durian, which is the AirTag, and another one for Hawkeye, which are likely third-party devices supported by FindMy. So let's hook the location daemon with some custom scripts. And now we can list all the opcodes. So this was a bit fast, but we can scroll back and see that there is various rows commands for the U1 chip. We can play a sound and various other things. Not all of them necessarily work. So not all of this is implemented on an in-production air tech, uh, but overall, it should work. And now we can, for example, test rows. And well, what you can see here, I wrote a hook that does not directly work, but it uh, gets the Durian service when I use it for the first time. So I have to play a sound. And now I also know which AirTag I'm executing this on. So if you have a lot of AirTags, that's not too bad as a feature to have one manual task in between. And now we can test rows. And you can see that like after one message, it just says like the ranging is complete and we have to stop. But if we had a U1 chip, more stuff would happen here. We can now also play a sound sequence. So in the sound sequence, the first one is the idea of the sound. The second one is how often it's going to be repeated. And then there is an offset and a pause. So we can also do a few more here, like sound ID number three, repeat it once. So using the scheme, we can play various stuff in here. All right, so that's the air techno, if you haven't heard it before. And now let's downgrade the firmware. 
We can download the firmware from the URL listed here. The firmware format is called super binary and can be unpacked by taking a look into the header. The super binary for the AirTag contains three firmware parts for the NRF, which are the soft device, bootloader and Bluetooth app, as well as their signatures. Moreover, it contains an FTAP, which is yet another format for firmware, and it contains the U1 firmware. For more details about U1 firmware, you can watch the DEFCON talk by Alexander and me from this year. On iOS, all external firmware from AirPods or the AirTag or keyboard, etc., it's all called a mobile asset and it's stored in here in this folder. The AirTag is internally called Durian, so the AirTag firmware is in this Durian firmware folder. If we take a look at this, you will see there's various assets that are already unpacked. So these are these folders and there is one large file, which is an XML file. So the XML file, first of all, has a build ID and this is describing the build. So also defines if it's a newer or an older version. There's also firmware version information down here. And then there is a base URL. So this is the base download URL, which is concatenated with the URL down here. So you could also download this from any browser if you um, do first copy of the base URL and then append the relative path URL. This is then continued with this B31. So this is the current firmware version that we are now going to look into. So it's already unpacked by iOS. If this is not the case, you can always pair an AirTag and wait a moment. So something like five minutes and then it should be downloaded and unpacked. So in here you can see there is an asset data folder. So this is the main folder that we are going to use. And the Durian firmware is also in there. And now the interesting part is what you can see. Uh, there is this older file, the Durian firmware mobile asset bin. So this is what you could also download if you download the zip file but then iOS would unpack all of them. So this is something that you would need to write a script for if you want to unpack it. But here iOS does it for us because in the mobile asset, the large one, there is the BLAP, SFTV, BLDR and so on. So these are the firmware files that are unpacked. And there is also the U1 firmware in the FTAP bin. And this is the one that we want to overwrite. And I can easily do this in a while loop. Now, the thing is, if I override the FTAP bin, usually it would just be unpacked again during the update process, but I can abuse this a bit because there is time of check versus time of use. So it's unpacked and then it takes a while until um, it's actually being used. If I do this, the update would no longer succeed because now the checksum that it takes and that it tries to get signed by the server would no longer match until I also install a Frida hook. So it's only one part of overwriting the firmware update, which I do now. All the other files down here uh, are also already overwritten by my Frida script. So this is just something because I am a bit lazy and overwrite the FTAP a bit differently. Let's take a look into the AirTag firmware update and how to instrument it for a downgrade. If an AirTag is paired, an update is scheduled to be started in five minutes. The search party daemon triggers this, which starts the firmware update daemon. The firmware update daemon is responsible for all mobile assets. One of the tasks executed by the firmware update daemon is executing the Durian updater service to update an AirTag. The updater service will double check if there are currently connected candidates to be updated. By hooking the beacon information in the search party daemon, we can trick the updater service to continue even though we are already up to date. As a next step, we have to download the firmware. 
Even if the firmware was already downloaded, it will be unpacked and checked again. Only the NRF firmware is already signed. The U1 firmware is signed with an individual signature for each unique chip identifier called ECID. Moreover, the U1 will only accept an update if the nonce matches the last one it generated. So the updater service is requesting this information via Bluetooth from the AirTag, which wakes up the U1 chip from standby and then forwards this information. This takes almost 15 seconds in which we can override the unpacked U1 firmware on disk with an older version. We keep the personalization information with the ECID and nonce intact. However, in the firmware update daemon, we have to replace the SHA digest of the U1 firmware with the one of the older version. The firmware update daemon will now contact the Tetsu signing server, also called TSS, and get a signature which is appended to the FTAP. Because of this, we can only downgrade the U1 firmware as long as it is signed. Finally, the actual firmware update is started via the location daemon. The location daemon reads the files for the NRF and U1 update from disk. We already replaced the U1 firmware, but we can also replace the NRF firmware here. And now the update is sent over the air file by file. So to summarize, we can downgrade to any U1 firmware version that is TSS signed, and we can downgrade to any NRF firmware version that has ever been released. To hook the update, I need multiple scripts. So the Bluetooth daemon hooking is just for debugging, we don't need it necessarily, but I'm hooking the firmware update daemon, the location daemon, and the search party daemon. So the firmware update daemon hook is the one that I need to override the FTAP signature. So the FTAP signature is part or stored in a dictionary, and in this dictionary, you can even see like some prints in the log and it looks like this. Uh, so it has the AP and DSP signature as a digest in here. And I'm currently just overwriting it statically with the one that I want for the file that I sent to it. And this is then actually being sent to the server for a signature. So if I look for the digest here, uh, so here is the dictionary. So it's a personalization object because it's personal for this specific air tag. And then when this dictionary is created, I will overwrite the values for the articulate OS and the DSP with my own values in here. The Next hook is in the location D, which is for the remaining firmware, which is not U1. And here we have basically two interesting hooks. So the first hook in here is just for information. So when the firmware update is entered, then the location daemon would get the path to where our asset is and we just print that for information so that we know, okay, now it just got this unpacked firmware and we are ready to update the firmware. And then I actually send all the binaries except for the U1 firmware to the script. And in here, I'm uh, just printing this as an information that I replaced all those blobs. And now the last bit of the firmware update is the hook into the search party daemon. So in the search party daemon, there is the firmware version and we just trick it into being the oldest stock firmware version so that it would accept any update, no matter which version. And down here, we are using this version string to replace it. So we can just override the versions. As you can see here, I have an AirTag and it's on the stock latest firmware and I did not change the serial ID or anything. In order to start a new firmware update, I have to remove the AirTag and pair it again so that the update check interval is five minutes.
So prior to pairing it again, I run my script and I'm already running the ftab overwrite loop so that also the ftab is overwritten. And as you can see here, I'm loading all the remaining blobs and send them to my Frida script. My script is working. This means that I'm already overwriting the serial and also the firmware version, which is now set to the oldest stock firmware version that was ever rolled out, but not with an update, but in factory. I also print all the other commands just for debugging. So I can also double check that I'm hooking the correct air tag here. And now all I have to do is wait for five minutes. I put the app in the background just to be sure that it does not interfere with the update process because it can also be canceled by the user. And while it's running, we can also look into the syslog because this is a bit more rubus than my script output. All right, so the firmware update is starting. We get the personalization info and run into the update. Meanwhile, in my script, you can already see uh, it also found out that the firmware update is going to start and I'm printing the DSP signatures and personalization info here. And I also then overwrote all the binaries. So asset one to six is the NRF and seven is the U1. This is not finished yet, so there is no output in my script, but as you can see in the syslog output, it's now sending all the assets. So basically uh, it says, for example, now it's sending the Bluetooth app and it waits until the download status is okay. One more thing. You can see that here it has the Nordic Manifest Diag and Diag signature. These are not part of the firmware update, so it's okay that these are missing. We are now at the R1 asset, which is the U1 chip, so it's called Rose, so that's why it's R1 here. And this one is the largest file, so this one takes the longest. All right, so we are finally done. There is probably still some artifacts when we open the Find My App. You can see my hook is still running, so it still tells it's on the oldest firmware version, which means next I have to stop my hook. But now it says the firmware version would be 10291 despite the downgrade which is because there is a beacon observation store and in the beacon observation store, it caches all the advertisements. So in order to see that we actually downgraded it and also see it in the user interface, I once more have to remove the air tag and add the air tag to my account. Okay. So let's take a look into it. And here you can see no hook, still the same serial, but the firmware is downgraded. Since this is a recorded talk, there's no Q&A, but you can reach me on Twitter and I will also upload the scripts in this video to the Simo GitHub account.